it's the first time I've, it's the first time I've given a talk in the Broughton Countryside Centre. Uh, and uh, I'd just like to say you know, a huge thanks and congratulations you know, for all you're doing for nature recovery in the area. I mean, it's absolutely outstanding. And if we could, uh, if we could clone you, and have a, a, a countryside centre in every you know, major population centre in the biosphere, wouldn't that be fantastic? I mean, it'd be really good. But you're doing great stuff. Um, as uh, Martin said, you know, despite all the work that the conservation organisations have done and individuals have done, you know, the land farmers, uh, uh, you know, the volunteer groups, despite all of that, uh, all the trends, you know, are still indicating that nature is fading. And in many places, nature has faded. You know, it's, it's, it's a, a real shadow of its former glory. And the time has come uh, for new ambitions and new approaches. And what I want to do this evening is to share with you uh, some of the work that we've been doing uh, in the Nature Improvement Group, which is one of the six groups that supports the, the North End Biosphere and its work, um, to really plot out our contribution to tackling the ecological emergency, which is you know, a global issue. Um, the scope of the plan, uh, and I'll say this at the beginning, uh, is for the uh, terrestrial and freshwater components of the biosphere uh, reserve. And the reason for that is that we already have a plan uh, for the, uh, the biodiversity for nature recovery in the marine areas, which was published uh, in uh, 2020 and obviously we, we need to link very closely with that but this is filling a major gap um, for the terrestrial areas and you know this vast area and I don't know whether anyone knows where this slide is taken from but you know here we are in Broughton uh, this is looking to the foothills of Dartmoor where the, the Torridge and bits of the sorry the Tor rises um, and across the much of the Torridge catchment to the right. It's um, Haverley Moor, for those who, who don't know it. It's a very special place, but it's a vast area. So, you know, very obviously, I'm speaking this evening to a, a converted audience. You're all really uh, very keen uh, environmentalists. You wouldn't be here otherwise, I don't think. But the question for us is how can we upscale the sort of work that you're all doing, whether it be in your garden, uh, or on a bit of nature reserve that you're helping or whatever, how can we upscale this to this whole area of the biosphere reserve? And it needs really ambitious action. So before I kick off, I'm going to just say a few words about a couple of initiatives that I've been involved with internationally, which have very much shaped my thoughts on the urgency and the uh, importance of doing things at scale. I've done a huge amount of work in Iran. I've been there 86 times. Uh, not many Brits have ever made it to Iran that many times. Um, and uh, this is a huge salt lake in the northwest of Iran um, called Lake Arumia. And the top graph shows the water level of the lake uh, from the beginning, from 1900 onwards until nearly the present. And as you can see, it was pretty stable, rising a bit, uh, and then a collapse started in uh, the turn of the century. And the two images show a green, beautiful catchment with this lake, which is 131 kilometers long. It's a huge lake and a vast catchment, bigger than Devon. Um, and then the picture on the right with it completely dried out. In this period leading up to the start of the collapse, the Iranian government built dams on every river flowing into it, it's a closed drainage basin. They put enormous irrigation schemes in and combined with increasing temperatures, increasing evaporation, drought, uh, basically this ecosystem collapse occurred. Um, it's a national park, it's a biosphere reserve, it's a Ramsar site. Um, huge impacts on people uh, and nature. This is the bed of the lake now. Um, that's a port, which is completely dried out. This is crystalline salt on the, uh, on the pier there. Um, you know, so a real ecological catastrophe at a very large scale. The second one I want to talk about is Mongolia, where I've also done a lot of work. Um, at first sight, a fantastic place, pristine ecosystems. There are only two roads really in Mongolia, one going north, south, one, east, west. And, you know, wonderful mountains, deserts, steppes, and wild rivers. Uh, and just the nomadic herders there, 
uh, as well as some really fantastic iconic uh, biodiversity. These are reintroduced Kuzowski horses. Um, there's things like the cyber antelope, um, goby bear, Bactrian cow, um, and the snow leopard, which I was lucky enough to see uh, once when I was there. Now, here again, there are desperate problems. Um, the amount of grazing animals in the country in the last 20 years has gone up from 18 million to 90 million. Um, climate change is biting really hard. Uh, so temperatures are going up, evaporation is going up. And most severely, half of Mongolia is underpinned under rain by permafrost. You wouldn't believe it, but it's underlain by permafrost. It's so cold in the winter. And that permafrost is melting and moving north. And the problem when that happens is that the sands, the deserts, they can't hold any water at the surface. It just, it just goes straight into the bottom. So the grazing systems that the nomads and all the wildlife are dependent on are looking like this. And the herders have to go you know, three or four kilometers every day from where they have their camp out to find first blade of grass you know, before their, their livestock can graze. So, um, you know, these are the sort of challenges that we're facing um, at a global level. And this is why, uh, you know, we are seeing this every evening uh, on our you know, television and every bit of media. Um, we're in the Anthropocene, we're in a very challenging situation of the linked climate and uh, ecological emergency. You know, whether it's Prince Charles, Prince William, uh, David Attenborough, even Harrison Ford, you know, standing up and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, trying to trying to get things moving. There are some good things going on. Um, I think the first piece of good news is that the, the G7, um, at their nature compact earlier this year, they basically have elevated nature to the same level as climate change. And that's really important because now the, the talk is all about being carbon neutral and nature positive. And, and the two are so intimately linked, you know, that, that's a really important step. You know, you're seeing lots of good things. I'm sure you're watching the Earthshot Prize that's uh, 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 on television at the moment. There's lots of exciting stuff going on uh, everywhere. But what does all this mean for North Devon? Um, well, I think the road sign uh, actually says it all. Um, yeah, we've got this fantastic accolade that's been given to us by UNESCO. Um, built on the environmental credentials of the area and the commitment of the community to sustainability. That's why uh, we were awarded the, the Biosphere Reserve. There are still some great places around, but pressure on the natural environment has been growing relentlessly. Uh, and here, nature is fading, uh, has faded uh, hugely from what it used to be. And the trends here are very much the same as across the rest of England, looking at the bird indicators, the farm, you know, the, the various indicators there are. They're no different in the biosphere as uh, to, to uh, other areas. And as you all know, uh, on you know, key measures, uh, the UK is one of the most nature depleted places on earth. We're 189th out of 214 countries as being the most nature depleted countries on earth. That's measuring you know, the amount of good habitat we've got. So, you know, we are absolutely part of the problem, absolutely part of the problem, the global problem. And that's why we need new approaches, um, you know, working across uh, this landscape. Now, we do have two things that are really in our favour. Um, the first is that we are a Nesco Biosphere, so that, that's fantastic. It's the really good thing about it is the boundaries because the boundaries make a lot of sense in terms of trying to do something for nature. They <clears throat> reflect the ecosystem, the system that links us all together. You know, how the land flows through the rivers and into the sea. It's a very logical scale at which to work. You know, you wouldn't be able to address the problems of water quality in the estuary if you weren't dealing with the areas uh, upstream. The second really good thing is that we have a very large partnership over 20 years of organizations. This is, I'm sure, incomplete, this thing is an old image. But there are, there are many, many organizations in the area are part of the Biosphere Partnership, from the national parks up at the top, you know, 
down to some of the education institutes, the, the government agencies, the local authorities, and of course, all the NGOs that are doing such great work. And that is a real, you know, that, that gives us a real opportunity to do things that other places can't do. Remember, this is not a big, it's not a protected area. You know, this is a big working landscape, mainly farmed or, or forests. So uh, having, you know, this sort of group uh, can, can really make a difference in terms of uh, what can be done. So we do have some nature rich areas, uh, still very much so. Um, many of them are around here. Uh, and uh, you could even say that some of the area is wild. I mean, the coast is pretty wild. Um, uh, Lundy, they're pretty good. Um, so there are nature rich areas, but going land, and you know, the really rich areas are often limited to some of the very small nature reserves that there are, um, or maybe a few individual farms where there's some really young people who are doing some really spectacular work. But the rest of the landscape, the bottom left there is mainly managed for intensive food production. And that's a single objective of management. The aim is to get food out. And of course, that's being driven by the policies and the funding of government. And that really means that all the other benefits that a sustainable use of that landscape, so producing food, storing carbon, holding water back, providing recreation, providing wildlife, uh, all of those benefits uh, are actually not being realized. They're, they're being lost to a very strong emphasis on food production. So our work on the uh, nature recovery plan started in the autumn of 2020, when we got together a bunch of taxonomists from, so, so specialists in different, I don't mean taxonomists really, I mean specialists in different taxa. And so we brought together a group uh, of everything from lichen specialists through to plant specialists through to uh, tree specialists, uh, mammals, birds, the works. And we had a, a workshop to try and think what is actually driving nature loss, because we really wanted to understand that before we started work on the plan. And the conclusion was that these six points in the top left are the main issues. Now, historical habitat conversion is what has had a very big impact in the past. Um, but habitat conversion has actually largely stopped. What's happening now, there is a bit going on still, but what is, what is happening now is mainly these further five issues. So intensification of land use, loss of ecosystem dynamism and functionality, soil degradation, nutrients eutrophication and biocides, and climate change. This group of taxa experts felt that those were the main things that were causing loss of nature. Now, you can look at the individual habitats in more detail, and there are certain other factors, and I'll mention that later on, but these were the sort of high level five ones. If we look at an image of the inland part of the biosphere reserve, and you can take it almost anywhere, um, we're talking about a highly modified landscape. This is on the mid, middle of the tour. Um, nature is basically corralled into small uh, fragments of woodland, uh, much of which quite a bit of that is actually coniferous uh, plantation woodland. Um, it's in very small patches of wildlife rich grassland. Uh, there are some orchards, there are some ponds. The rivers are very constrained. The floodplains have almost all been converted from nature-rich floodplains into uh, intensively farmed uh, agriculture. And the vast majority of it is, is actually uh, intensively managed grassland or arable land. Uh, the grassland often having perhaps three crops of silage taken off it um, per year, uh, and biocides being used on much of the uh, the arable land. These, of course, have huge impacts on soil health, but also on the uh, whole of uh, biodiversity, uh, wildflowers, insects, everything else. And the other thing you can see there is that there's remarkably little dynamism or connectivity uh, in the habitats. So we don't have any room 
to criticize Brazil in any way. I mean, they've got far more uh, natural habitats than we've got. You know, we are, we are way, 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 way further back. Um, and the, you know, the challenges here are, are uh, you know, just as serious. Um, development pressure um, from building new uh, houses and industrial estates is certainly an issue in certain areas, particularly along the coast and around some of the big uh, centres. But it actually covers only a very small proportion, it's a bit less than 5% uh, of the biosphere area, um, the, the, the urban areas. And actually most of the, most of the development, and I say most uh, uh, exaggerated a bit, it is most of the development is occurring on habitats, which are actually not of very great value for nature. Um, so we thought in that group that met that um, development wasn't an enormous issue. Look back to the sort of 1950s and much of the inner part of the Biosphere Reserve may have looked more like the image on the left. Um, what you can see there, it's already a highly modified environment, but there's still some dynamism and some nature in there. So uh, some very rich grasslands, uh, woodlands, uh, growing out hedges, connecting them. Um, you know, quite a, a wildlife rich habitat. But increasingly, um, the uh, area is now looking like this image on the right, which is an area near South Moulton. And there are many, many other places you could look at that where the fields are much larger. So a lot of the hedges have been lost. Um, the hedges are being managed very hard. They're not connecting uh, anything. Much of the woodland is gone. And, you know, frankly, in terms of nature, there's not a lot of nature in those habitats. I do urge you all to have a look at Devon Environment Viewer. It's a really interesting uh, mapping uh, facility that DCC has put together, where you can look at, uh, from the tide maps years back, through to the earliest aerial images, uh, earliest satellite images, to the current, and you can put your postcode in, put any postcode in, and look and see how it's changed. And it's really, really interesting, uh, absolutely fascinating. So our work on the Nature Recovery Plan uh, drew from the excellent work that John Lawton did in work called Making Space for Nature, just published in 2010, where he identified that the priority was to make more space for nature, to make these spaces uh, more, bigger, better, and joined up. And that graph on the uh, top left-hand side is really what he was proposing. And he suggested there should be uh, large core areas, perhaps built around existing really good places for nature, with buffers around them, um, with restoration areas, corridors between them, and then sitting in a landscape which he called a sustainable use area, which would be the area that's farmed, but which is still contributing to nature's recovery. So we very much adopted uh, that in the two goals that underpin the nature recovery plan with the aim of trying to get 30%, by 2030, 30% of the land within the biosphere reserve into uh, semi-natural biodiversity rich habitat in good condition. That's the really important thing. And much of the uh, so-called biodiversity rich habitat is not in good condition at the moment, and that's the real priority. And then for the remaining 70% of the area to try and integrate nature into these economic activities. And we, we identified four principles. One is about making space for nature. One is that we can tackle the ecological and the climate emergencies together by nature-based uh, solutions. Uh, so, uh, you know, restoring peat bogs up on the top of the moors, uh, you know, we'll hold back water, fantastic things for nature, store carbon. The other recognition is point number three, is that communities and particularly farmers and landowners have to be at the heart of this effort because the farmers and landowners are responsible for the majority of the area and communities because they are, in my mind, the game changer. Um, it's engaging and galvanizing communities is where we can make a real difference I think, beyond where we are now. I'll come back to that. 
and then uh, that any further development should actually lead to a net gain in nature. So uh, this 30% target, um, I had a picture on the last slide of Boris Johnson. He declared it when he said at the UN General Assembly last year, he said, we want to have 30% of the UK uh, protected. Uh, uh, and, but in fact, he used the word landscape as a protected landscape, which he can get away with without protecting it from nature, which is an interesting thing, because he could just create another national park. And, and do it. But of course, you know, national parks have other objectives. You can make more AOBs. Nature, until recently, hasn't been a major part of their being. Um, but the interesting thing is that other countries have been doing this for an awful long time. Mongolia, which I mentioned before, um, they, in the Earth Summit at the end of in 1990s, they said, we're going to declare, we're going to make 30% of our country uh, for nature, protected for nature. Where they are now is those green areas are their national parks. That adds up to 20% of the country. And those light green areas are what they call locally protected areas, which local communities, the herders, have established themselves to stop overgrazing and to stop mining, which is their main issue in Mongolia. And they add up to 17%. So Mongolia is now at 37%, and they're still designating. They designated one of 420,000 hectares about two months, about a year ago. Just phenomenal. Um, so this target of 30% is, I think, a really important target to, to go for, and it is underpinned by some good uh, ecological thoughts. So as Martin said at the beginning, um, this is what the, the plan uh, looks like in terms of structure. It took about eight months. Uh, 50 people, uh, 20 of the partners of the Biosphere Reserve working together. We went out to consultation, firstly to the farming community. We went out to 12 farming organizations and then to 150 farmers across the Biosphere Reserve to ask them their opinions. Um, and we then uh, had a public consultation uh, in July, August onwards. Um, and uh, basically we were incorporating comments from that and that, that is uh, how the plan has been pulled together. It has a 2030 vision, uh, but this plan is for the first five years. And what we're planning to do is then to update it, uh, see how we get on uh, in the next five years so that we can hopefully get to, the, get to the vision. There are many different ways to structure a plan like this, but this is what we ended up with. Um, uh, we concluded this was the sort of most logical. There are overlaps between these categories here, but that's quite good news in many ways. Yeah, we know that that is, is good. Um, the introduction is, is, is an interesting bit because it has some assessment of how we, where we are on the 30% target right now. Uh, and that's a really difficult piece of work. And the main conclusion of our work is that we don't have enough data. Um, the problem we've got is that the, particularly the intensively managed grasslands, which cover a vast proportion of the biosphere, you can't distinguish those on the images we've got from the semi-improved and the uh, semi-natural grasslands. It's very difficult to distinguish them. And we got some interesting uh, you know, uh, satellite data, but it's got too many errors. The, the, the error levels are, are too great in it. So I think we need a PhD or someone to sit down and really go at it and try and sort this out for us, because at the moment we don't know exactly where we are uh, on this. So you're going to see a few wonderful photographs now, um, and they have a name Martin Bat uh, on. <laughs> All the good photographs that you're going to see after this are not mine. Um, uh, and I thank everyone who has contributed photographs to the, uh, to the rest of this. So um, the plan, basically the key thing is that the plan identifies actions and it identifies which of the partners are going to be involved in, in dealing with it and which parts of the community really need to be engaged to deal with it. And then each of the plans has a lot of supporting information behind it. Uh, as I said, there is a vision and uh, I've just highlighted a few bits in there. Um, uh, the key message is that by the end of by the way, when we get to the end of 2030, the key thing is that we want nature to be recovering rather than fading, which is where we are now. And we want to see lots of signals of nature recovering, 
be it the habitats, the species, um, some reintroductions here, uh, and the community need to be absolutely at the heart of it is the key message. Now, um, I'm going to run through very quickly each of the five plans. It's going to take me uh, a bit too long, really, because I'm running a bit slow already. But the coast plan, I would like to say, first of all, that the AOMB and Martin, who chaired the group that uh, developed it, um, the AOMB uh, has uh, jointly prepared and endorsed the plan, which is a fantastic thing. So we've got the AOMB and the Biosphere working together uh, very closely on this. The coast has some particular challenges, which I've listed there, but there are also some really big opportunities. You know, the AOMB itself, uh, organizations like the National Trust and other partners, there are some very interesting new finance opportunities for landowners in the area. So I'm just gonna pick out a flavor of some of the things that are in the coast plan. You need to read it, and I warn you, it's not a bad time reading these. These are quite technical documents, so don't, don't uh, sit down with a cup of Horlicks and try and, try and read them, because <laughs> uh, you've got to see it. Um, uh, but what we want to do, well, we want to try and uh, really improve some of the natural habitats on the coast by restoration and management activities. The wildlife rich cliff top uh, grasslands, heath and scrub habitats, the dunes. Now, there's obviously an awful lot going on already on these areas. And uh, you know, what the plan is doing is building on the existing work that's been done, which is you know, really, uh, really good work. Um, water quality sticks, the tour, uh, grazing marshes around Broughton and Chivena, and establishing new reed bed areas and salt marshes along the estuary. And promoting conservation measures for coastal birds, including recolonization of the coast by chuffs. And what fantastic news that they were on Heartland very recently. How many were there? Four, I think. Is that right? Yeah, yeah fantastic. So we might get that one. You know, uh, we need to get a bit more habitat. Uh, Lundy, obviously, key for seabirds, keep that going and try and facilitate the return of uh, breeding white tailed eagles to Lundy. They are moving around at the moment. So maybe we will be able to get them back by 2030. A few other targets, a really important one is reducing disturbance um, on the coast. It's a really big issue. Uh, so for waders on the wader roosts and for seals, and establishing some disturbance-free areas for breeding waders like wind plover and various other species and trying to get them back. Um, the councils are all really committed to this. All these organizations that, you know, who are involved in it have signed up to this and they are hopefully we can do it. Um, just scan through it. Safeguard the important uh, colony of greater horseshoe bats at Broughton. Uh, you know, I've been talking to, to John about that and there's big issues there to deal with. Um, and then some actions for some of the dead and special species, um, these lichens and the beach coma beetle, which uh, uh, if it's found to be extinct, uh, maybe we could try a reintroduction from um, Wales. So uh, moving on to the action plan for grassland and arable. This was the toughest of the plans to produce um, uh, because if we're going to tackle the ecological and climate emergency, we need to bring farming and nature conservation closer together. Um, they are polarized at the moment. And that's only going to be achieved by uh, the engagement of farmers and landowners. And that brings uh, lots of issues in about farm profitability, about incentives to farmers to help them engage with these sort of processes. But there are some opportunities. There's big changes going on in the policy and subsidies. There's an increasing interest in regenerative farming. And there are new sources of finance, which I'll mention again uh, later. Most important thing is to protect the good areas that we've got. They are the most important and we've got to look after them. But we need them to convert, we reckon possibly maybe 10,000 hectares of uh, intensively managed grassland into uh, habitats of higher wildlife value. Um, promoting agroforestry, uh, having more trees in the farm landscape will be very beneficial and then taking some significant areas out of intensive farming for wilding. Um, 
and that would uh, logically focus on areas which are not good for farming or, or dangerous for farming because of uh, erosion runoff, or some of the less favoured area, for example, in the upper storage, um, where farming is, is you know, really very difficult to make profitable, and maybe with some of the new schemes and maybe some opportunities for farmers to go into something like this. Um, so there's lots of other uh, initiatives uh, to pursue to try and improve the farming environment here, trying to reduce the amount of biocides that are going into the systems, lots of habitat creation, and again, measures for some of the Devon special species and declining species, many, in fact, several of which we've lost already, curly uh, lapwing is lost pretty much. There's a, there's a bird on, on agricultural land across Devon, not just the bicycle. Um, curlew are, I think they're past their last legs now, but as a breeding species uh, on the farm. Um, so, you know, there's really challenging issues and the climate change is clearly playing a role there as well. That picture of the Kestra box was, um, we had a scheme with the Pledge of Nature project that Emily organises uh, to get farmers to put Kestra boxes up. And there was a farmer who was an artist, he, he's a sculptor, and he didn't just build a Box, which I done. He built this remarkable thing, put it up. He put it up in March, and within 10 days, a pair of kestrels, the first they'd ever had on the farm, um, occupied it and bred successfully in it. Wasn't that fantastic? Just mm -hmm. wonderful. Um, so, the Towns and Villages Action Plan, I think the key thing to say here is there is huge opportunity in the built up areas, uh, the uh, urban areas of the biosphere. These are potentially, you know, they can be uh, fantastic areas for nature in, in what is at the moment a landscape that's quite devoid of nature in many places. You know, across uh, gardens, schools, churchyards, community and business spaces, the lanes that connect them. And we do have very engaged local authorities, and I'll talk about that in a minute, and community groups. Um, you know, there's some really great groups doing good things. And hopefully we can get some nature gain out of any of the new developments that are occurring. So uh, the aims here in the next uh, years are to uh, really increase the amount of tree cover, um, to manage the, the uh, verges and connecting areas much better for wildlife. And then particularly to work with individuals in terms of families, but also businesses schools, churchyards and public spaces to really try and improve them for wildlife. I mean, you all know, I put, I put this, this pond into our garden. This was a flat bit of lawn, which I used to mow every, every couple of weeks. I put that pond in a year ago. And it's just extraordinary. You know, it's just extraordinary. It's just been fantastic. I've just loved it. You know, I've got a big pond on the farm, but yeah, I've done this you know, on the lawn. And it, it's just amazing. And yeah, if we could get everyone to do one of those, you know, fantastic, it makes such a difference. Um, lots of things can be done, helping different species, um, again, minimizing the use of pesticides and uh, peat-based products. And then this last one is really interesting. Uh, there's a new scheme called Building with Nature, uh, which has standards for green infrastructure and for incorporating nature-friendly things into new developments. And uh, North Devon Council, uh, I, I told them about it a year ago, they've already signed up to it, they can get accredited and then the new developments can be certified to have met the Building with Nature standards. Uh, Torridge is also interested in building on training courses. So this is really good news, we could get some really good, really good gain out of that. Trees, woodlands and hedges. Um, Lots of opportunities for uh, obviously carbon sequestration and using trees and hedges to deal with flooding issues by holding water back. Um, and there are so many new funding sources for planting trees, it's just, uh, just extraordinary. So there are many opportunities there. Oop, what's happened? That's good. Oh, let's see if it comes back. Come back. No, it's no, it's on, it's on the screen. Should I take this out?
Hey, there we go. Uh, so how do I get it back to there? That's interesting. Uh, are you on duo display, dual display, maybe? That's it. Good. <laughs> Apologies, everyone. <laughs> So as you're aware, uh, the UK is right at the bottom in terms of uh, tree cover uh, compared to all other European countries. So we are at about, uh, at the moment, about 12% cover uh, with, with trees compared to all the other European countries there, which are way above us. The graph on the right shows what's happened. We reached the, the absolute low uh, after the, uh, the First World War, when many of our woods were cut for use in the war. And since then, tree cover has been growing, uh, and as I say, is now about 12%, 13%, and we are actually at the same level in the biosphere. It's about 12, 13%. So it's quite interesting that, uh, that, that we're at that. Um, so let me just, sorry, I'm not actually on the wrong screen now. Don't I? Let me get us back. Right. And I'm going to get that back. Haha. -ha. That's good, <laughs> right, we <but> better. <laughs> so, um, so the action plan for trees, woods and hedges uh, involves uh, a lot of efforts to try and increase the amount of tree cover. And I think the key message here is that there are a couple of ways of doing it, and this is detailed. One is by planting and one is by uh, natural regeneration. I think there's a lot more interest in natural regeneration now uh, because it's often more successful. Um, but also, uh, uh, so, sorry, yeah, so, so yeah, increasing the, the tree canopy cover there. So the other, other key thing is uh, bringing the woods that we've got uh, back into uh, better management. And there are some big issues around uh, uh, non-native invasive species in woodlands which need to be tackled. Um, you're aware of uh, issues around uh, laurel and rhododendron and things like that, which cause a lot of problems. Uh, but also uh, the issue of dealing with uh, particularly grey squirrels, which can be a, a real problem <coughs> if you're trying to establish broadleaves. Hedgerow creation, again, we have some, uh, the Devon Hedge Group is, is very active, uh, excellent group, uh, part of the partnership. And there are some quite big areas of the biosphere reserve where our iconic hedges, which are just such a special thing for Devon and for the, the biosphere reserve, um, are now at pretty low densities, so less than 10 kilometers of hedges per kilometer squared. And the idea is to focus on those areas to try and get more hedges into those areas, but also bring better hedges, hedges into better condition for wildlife. Um, an interesting one is, uh, uh, which is actually, uh, you know, there's, there's a, a group already looking at it, is looking at the reintroduction of pine marten um, as a potential control method for grey squirrels. Um, they, have, they have been hugely successful in, in Ireland, um, where uh, now um, basically red squirrel has, has you know, really bounced back. Um, and there are projects going on elsewhere in the country, as I think you, you know. And then several uh, Devon special species occur in the uh, woodlands where uh, uh, different activities are needed. Devon white wing, dormouse, and some of the whole nesting birds. Uh, the action plan for wetlands and water bodies, the last one, um, is really important. It's what connects the whole system together. And there are some really big challenges, and there are some uh, important opportunities. And uh, the situation at the moment is really very bad indeed. Everyone in the biosphere reserve, every resident in the biosphere reserve should know about this. Uh, our rivers are in really bad condition. These are the Environment Agency uh, assessments on the ecological status of the 100 subcatchments in the biosphere reserve. Uh, the, on the left is 2016, on the right is 2019. None of them meet high quality status. 18 of the 100 meet good quality status, and that had declined to 15 by 2019, so we're going downhill. And the rest are either in moderate or poor ecological status. Um, this is a disgrace. You know, it's, you're, you've got a meeting next week looking at this in more detail. 
and uh, I'm not going to go on about it now, but it's a disgrace, and everyone should know about it because you know our rivers, you know the the Atlantic salmon, the the uh, environment agency classes it as at risk in the torridge and probably at risk in the tor. You know it's on its last legs, literally on its last legs. It used to be so abundant. You know uh, where I live, they used to take pitchforks down in the evening at night and just lift them out. You know. Now they, they, they're almost on the edge of going. The pressures on our rivers are huge. These pictures are all taken near my house up at the top of the tall catchment above Chumley. This is a maize field, top left, uh, with a large pile of slurry that has been put in there. A uh, big rainfall event flowing out onto the lane, the next picture, and then flowing into the river. Um, the picture on the right is even more worrying. This was at low water levels. It wasn't a big, a big rainfall event. It was just a small shower. But uh, this was in the summer about, about two months ago. Um, and, you know, when the water goes like that, you know, it's killing everything in there. And there's just, there's just soil building up now. It used to be really clean until about five years ago. There's one, uh, one dairy farm above us, which is where it's coming from. And, you know, this is why our rivers are failing. And then Chumley Sewage Works, um, only one of the systems has been working for the last seven years. And it's just not enough to keep Chumley going. It's going into the river. So uh, there's lots to do. Um, I'm running out of time. So I'm just going to uh, move on. I mean, there's lots to do from the top of the catchment, protecting the peat bogs, down to reducing all the sources of pollution and strengthening the eyes on the river, I mean, this is something that every citizen can do, is, you know, eyes on the river. So we've got a scheme that we're <coughs> setting up. Emily is working with uh, the West Country Rivers Trust, um, and they have a citizen science monitoring scheme where they'll give you water quality, quality monitoring kits, costs about 25 quid, um, and you can then monitor your own river and flag up when you're getting um, uh, peaks that, that you know, don't meet the standards. So really important. <clears throat> Beavers, absolute game changer in my view. I think they can do uh, really something very special. Again, we've got actions for dead and special species. Um, and then there's a real issue around non-natives, uh, both the plants and the river systems. But this guy, the North American signal crayfish, is a real worry. It's now in the torridge. Um, it's on the bar uh, in large numbers. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's serious. It has big impacts both on the habitat um, and on the uh, other wildlife in the, in the river. And they can become very numerous. So I wanted to spend the sort of last 10 minutes talking about um, scaling up the action. Um, and I really welcome your thoughts on this bit because this is the really important bit. I mean, you're all you know, experts in your own right. You, you know what you're doing. But... But the key thing is how do we scale up? And I'm going to divide it into two bits. Firstly, talking about the organizations and then talking about you know, the community uh, in its widest sense. Um, so, you know, there are lots of organizations already involved, um, but the reality is that although a few of them are growing, um, happily DWT is one of the ones that's growing, it's doing very well. Um, Others, the Environment Agency, Natural England would be good examples, have been losing money hand over fist, losing staff. Um, and the reality is that there are actually very few, in terms of professional bodies, there are very few feet on the ground in North Devon, the Biosphere Reserve. The Biosphere team is tiny, the AOB team is tinier, um, uh, you know, and, and many of these organisations actually don't have people in North Devon. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, there is a real issue there. But I think, um, you know, they are doing a fantastic job. They're all working at full stretch. And therefore, in many ways, you can't expect them to do a lot more, this gear change, this step change that's needed. Um, but the plan, which has been produced by them, um, means that we can focus our efforts and budgets on the things that have been identified as important. We can improve the partnerships and the way they're working. We can seek new funds for projects that have been identified in the plan. And that's that's you know, really straightforward. We go to the lottery and say, we want to do this and, and get it. We can support and coordinate community efforts because that's really important. I mean, one of the things that's really difficult for individuals is how do I engage? Yeah, how do I engage? 
and it does need coordination. Lovely, again, one of our trust local groups, fantastic, you know, doing that. But we need lots more of these you know, community groups doing things, and it does require coordination, whether it's by volunteers or, or by paid people. And then tracking progress. But I think the real game changer is in scaling up action at the community level. And this can be, uh, this can be, you know, there are obviously lots of groups already doing good things. Um, a lot of them are specialist groups and, uh, you know, they're doing fantastic stuff. But what we need to do is to bring new people uh, into these groups um, and particularly engage youth in the huge interest that they've got about the current crisis that, that, that we're facing. And, uh, you know, there's some great examples out there. I've mentioned one or two already, but let's say a you know, class of Free North Devon, um, coastwise, you know, there's the, the Pledge for Nature project bringing in lots and lots of individuals to do different things. So, you know, those are, those are really important. Um, I think the challenge we've got is to move from working at, you know, trying to engage individuals, which is what we've been doing with Pledge for Nature for quite a while, to actually trying to engage um, parish and town councils across the area um, and community groups in those parishes, um, farmer and landowner groups, um, businesses, schools. I mean, there is a huge amount more that can be done in all of these areas if we can crack the way uh, to get it uh, moved up. And with the plan, we've uh, basically initiated that process with a first step in trying to get uh, these different groups to sign up to the Nature Recovery Declaration for the Biosphere Reserve to commit to doing something. Um, and as you see, we've identified all these groups that I've just mentioned uh, on here. Um, we're going to keep pushing this for the next five years, probably, uh, sign-ups. Um, but in the two months that we've had since we uh, launched it, uh, we've had almost 350 individuals signed up, 27 businesses, 46 farmer landowners, uh, only four local authorities at the moment, but that's growing, 26 other organisations and six schools. So really going well. And if, um, if you haven't signed it, I'd be really grateful. If you know a business or a school that might be interested in signing it, you know, please get them to sign it. And I'll say a few words about uh, how that can be done at the end. Uh, the Pledge for Nature project, um, despite the pandemic, has gone really well. Um, taking the declarations as well, we've had almost 800 signatures under Pledge for Nature with over two and a half thousand pledges now who are doing something for nature. So it's really, it's really growing. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's bringing in new people who, who haven't been engaged. So again, I think the more we can do on this to try and uh, promote these things, the better, you know, uh, bring smiles to people's faces. <laughs> um, and this is the list of some of the organizations that have joined so far. Um, the local authorities, we, uh, Torridge of just sorry, district council have now agreed to sign, so that's great. So they'll be going on. We've got Devon County already, North Devon already, um, and the, we're now working <coughs> on the parishes. Uh, Chumley has just agreed. Yes, I think yes. Broughton has agreed. Isn't it? Yes, I think yes. yeah, Broughton's agreed. So there'll be a few more joining the list there. So it's it's growing. There are some big players in there. We've got Clinton Devon Estates. I mean, they're huge. Yeah, they own lots of land in the biosphere. Southwest Water have signed it. I don't know whether they knew what they were signing, I think they did. <laughs> Petrock has signed it, you know, which is really good news. So there's some big players in there. Um, but I think one of the exciting areas to work on is this idea of working at parish level and with local community groups. The Devon Local Nature Partnership has just set up a system for each parish to have a representative um, as to join to make a wildlife network. Now they're going to find it pretty difficult just with the parish council to do a lot, but I think if we can help them, and particularly if there are community groups to work with them, we can do a huge amount. I mean, there are already, in my parish, Chumley, we've got this fantastic group, it's a sustainable Chumley on the bottom left there, which is set up in the last year and a bit. Uh, it's now got 257 members. Oh, it's phenomenal. You know, and it's, uh, this is sustainable chumley out planting trees. They were, uh, this is along a water course, which was being damaged by uh, a runoff going into it. 
and uh, you know they're out there kind of doing stuff. Um, really, really exciting. Um, <clears throat> so I think working with these people to develop a nature plan for the parish and to uh, really engage and get the farmers engaged in it, um, to really try and do something at that level, I think that's a good scale uh, to try and work at. Farmer groups are really important as well because uh, farmers prefer to hear from peers rather than from conservation organisations, quite rightly. Um, and, uh, you know, these farmer groups are really good. We've already got four uh, such groups in the Biosphere Reserve area. Um, the one I'm involved with, which is the Tor Valley Farmers Group, has now 80 members, which is pretty damn good. And this is the Tor Valley Farmers Group actually out on the Torridge. Would you believe we're in the Torridge catchment there, but we, 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 we trespassed a bit. Um, but I think there's great opportunities there to do stuff with those groups. And then finally, look at resourcing. Um, you know, it's going to need funds, of course. And the first four of those bullets are traditional funds, really. So getting better use of the existing funds we've got, new projects I've mentioned, volunteering, which is already going, but can be grown. Then we've got the farming funds. And of course, we've got the existing countryside stewardship, but we've got the new environmental land management scheme, which is going to come online in 2024 and will uh, replace the single farm payments, which are causing some of the damage that's going on at the moment. And the AOMB and the National Parks have also got this new Farming and Protected Landscapes Fund. But the really exciting one is the bottom two, and that's green finance. Now, uh, there is a revolution uh, going on at the moment. I'll, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in a, in a minute, but there is a revolution going on in, in the financial world. The, uh, the stock markets are doing a race to be the greenest stock market in the world. The, every top company has got a sustainability director. Um, you know, uh, the uh, investors are demanding uh, higher and higher environmental and social responsibility in terms of what's happening. And there are new opportunities opening up for companies uh, and pension funds to do impact investing in environmental stuff. And if we can now link that up with farmers who are basically uh, going to have the opportunity to uh, auction nature and auction carbon and auction water uh, conservation, you know, there's a real opportunity there. And the other issue is uh, stopping finance that harms nature. There's, um, you know, there's a lot of things going on which are damaging the environment, which are receiving finance from, from ourselves, from the money that we have and from banks. And, you know, uh, stopping that, this is uh, just a slide, I told Martin I was going to put this on. Um, the power of collective voice, stranded assets. Um, basically, it's become unacceptable to finance things that are, um, you know, using fossil fuels. And Mark Carney, uh, the former governor of the Bank of England, he said that uh, five years ago, he nearly got shut down, you know, but it's becoming a reality, it's becoming unacceptable. To fund things, you know, in five years' time, when climate change has gone a step further, you know, I'm sure that that will be the case. And I think the same with you know some of the supermarkets and other things that we buy from and everything else. They are going to be the ones who will stop having these things. In, they will stop having things that depend on fossil fuels in their in their uh, stores. They'll stop having things that are damaging nature in their stores. And that process is happening already. Um, you know, as this huge change in the finance markets across the world is happening. So, you know, things that are, you know, putting lots of pesticides into the environment or things that are causing pollution to our rivers. In five years' time, if this trend continues, these guys won't be selling it to us. You know, and that will cause change. So, um, I just want to finish with this to say that celebrating uh, good things that are going on is really important. Uh, last year, we launched the Biosphere Nature Awards 2020 uh, with categories for schools, individuals, businesses, seven or eight categories, I think. Yeah, exactly. And we're, we're running it again this year. So if you know anyone who has done something really good for nature this year, if it's a farmer or, or someone you know who's done something really good, not my anything. <laughs> nominate them and, uh, because it really does put a smile on people's faces you know uh, we've got some really good feedback 
uh, from it. And we're going to keep this going now <clears throat> every year as the nature awards for the area. Um, so the great man, uh, uh, he always says, says I think the, you know, the most important thing, and this is what he said at the end of uh, Life on Our Planet, and I think you know, he's, he's absolutely right. Um, you're, you're all doing a huge amount, and uh, you know it would be invidious of me to uh, to ask more of you. But I think um, if you could help with getting people to sign the declaration, that would be really helpful. If you haven't signed it yourself, uh, sign it, and I'll put the QR code for those who are really uh, techy up on the screen. Otherwise, I think uh, Emily might have um, some hard copies. Um, promote the Advice and Nature Awards. If you know of any good projects, that would be fantastic. And I think the most important one, if you know anyone who might be willing to stick their heads above the parapet and work with their parish to try and stimulate some action in the parish and get a local community group going in the parish, that would be the most valuable thing. You know, there are some already. Uh, there are a few community groups in, across the area, but it's probably only five or six or seven, really, at that, at that scale. Um, if we could get that going, I think it would make a really huge difference. So I'm going to stop there, and, uh, and thank you all. I've, I'm afraid I've taken rather well more time than I should. <laughs> well, thank you very much indeed, Mike. That was a very, yes, very you, okay. stimulating and also very, uh, very worrying um, presentation. Um, we all think we live in a beautiful and relatively unspoiled county and we do but it is being spoiled as we as we speak and we sit here and uh, we only have a short time to uh, to do something about it so it's a salutary reminder really that Devon is under threat the wild Devon but one of the key factors in our favor I think is that is the wealth of support that we've got from organizations like this and wildlife trust the sheer concentration of organizations in Devon struck me when I moved here from Yorkshire but we had a wildlife trust but we didn't have too much else we had RSPB but uh, the strength of local groups is really noticeable here so have you got any questions are there any questions on the on the um, Zoom. If anyone on Zoom has any questions, you can either raise your hand or put them in the chat and we'll read them out. Or if anyone here has any questions. I had one for you, Mike, just yeah. to kick things off. We've heard a lot about uh, wood pasture. And that's, for me, that's quite a new thing. I'm, I'm more of a coast person, as you know. But what, it, what are the main benefits of having trees in the middle of grassland? What, what does that do for, for the environment and nature? Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, you can have trees in many forms uh, from wood pasture, which is quite a, uh, a, a specific yeah. one to the, the whole breadth of agroforestry in its, in its broadest sense. And I think we're going to see you know, a lot of agroforestry actually coming in uh, in the future. I mean, again, it's something that in the UK we are we are really quite far behind. Uh, you know, if you go to many other European countries, Countries, agroforestry is well integrated in, into what they're doing in, in agriculture, and it it has huge benefits. You know, it has benefits for the soils. Uh, it has benefits for nature. It has benefits for holding water uh, in the soils, and obviously for, for carbon. Um, so there are, there are there are massive benefits, and you know many of these habitats, you know, particularly when you start talking about older trees, um, you know, start to be seriously interesting. You know, for for biodiversity in its, its broadest sense. Same true for old orchards. I mean, again, they, they can be really, uh, really nature rich if they are managed uh, sympathetically uh, right. for it. So it's the insect population <clears throat> and therefore the birds and Absolutely, so absolutely. Yeah, I, yeah. I give, give you an example. I mean, we planted a, an orchard 20 years ago um, and it's become a staging post for spotted flycatchers. Yeah, yes. spotted flycatchers, you know, it's been going down like this. I regularly see I saw 17 together in the in the in our one acre orchard last year. Yeah. You know, and this yeah. year it was uh, had the whole yes, yeah. three or four families going through. It's, so you can do a lot by by mm. some careful planting and making a crop. You know, so it's yeah. not just I think Mary has. Is it one of the best examples for the pasture of some of the um, 
places like you know Arlington, Sunderland, I've been a few today, you know, places where the last people passed Birmingham years ago. Um, even parts of Philly estate and that as well. Yeah. And so I mean wood pasture and those obviously the veteran trees like the sort of like said, but I mean a lot of them are actually esthetized in rare life trees. And um, because obviously the trees can reach their proper mature stature in, in the um, pasture. And so a lot of it's old grassland. So you know, obviously it's difficult to plow up even if you wanted to, you know, around uh, large trees like we've got, say, mm. you know, Arlington's probably a good example, which is just probably familiar with that. Um, and obviously there used to be a lot of them. A lot of them obviously were on the big estates from that years ago. And um, uh, yeah, they're very good for invertebrates. There's certainly a lot of rare invertebrates that only inhabit sort of wood pasture. I mean, one of the famous places in the country is Mrs. Park in, in Herefordshire, or something like that. But I mean, in North Devon, yes, some of the owls are National Trust. I mean, Dunton is fantastic. Um, even over bits near the belly in that as well. Um, but they're, they, most of them now are associated with some of the um, um, Estates and that, yeah. but yeah. definitely it's the epiphytic um, flora, the you know, the rare life things and the uh, rare fights as well. I mean, over at Nettleton Court, where we've done surveys and things, um, so yeah, they are fantastic. Yeah, I think they, I hope people the, managed to pick that up on Zoo. Did, uh, can people hear? Mary was just uh, giving some, some really great examples of some of the, particularly the estates, yeah. which have got some really good. Uh, wood pasture, which is uh, you know got a lot of uh, ancient veteran trees, um, and really important for lichens and and uh, yeah. nature in its broadest sense. I, I think the the thing that's going to drive it as well, climate change. You know, it's really interesting. You know, a lot of these big dairy herds now are in fields where the hedges have been you know, cut to right down here, no trees. The heat that we're getting in the summer, you know, if you let a, a herd of cattle into a field with trees. Where they go, straight right. Right. and the energetic implications, you know, for the farmer of, of uh, these cows, you know, being in in those very stressful conditions, are mm. significant. So I think we are going to we're going to see, you know, climate change driving again some nature-based solutions, yeah. which will benefit nature. Yeah, and Mike, you you talked about the farming in protected landscapes work. That's only just started. The ARMB has been given one hundred and forty thousand pounds until to spend by the end of March. And we're getting a steady stream of projects from landowners and farmers. National Trust were first to come in, of course, they always are, but very quickly behind them have been uh, small farmers and small landowners doing things. And we, we're using the, the biodiversity, the nature recovery plan as our guide as to what kind of projects we want to see. So it's already coming in, yeah. into use. Yeah. It's and really exciting, and yeah. You know, new funds, uh, new opportunities. Yeah, and, and farmers, every bit makes a difference. Absolutely, and farmers do want. They're in this position where they're they're, they're having their funding for uh, nature and and uh, the, the the natural landscape reduced because we we've, we've left the European Union. They've got a promise of the environmental land management uh, scheme, but that's not yet fully developed. So farming and protected landscapes is a way of of bringing that on, learning some lessons before that comes in in 2024. So I'm, I'm really hopeful yeah. that we get some really good projects. I think what I would really like to see is for us to have a challenge fund of some sort uh, for the whole of the biosphere area, which farmers could apply to. So it, it could come from a whole diversity of sources, um, yeah, from some of the big financial institutions or whatever. But they could basically uh, say, well, we're willing uh, to give up this field uh, for nature in return for, you know, for this. It might be a floodland meadow or something. Uh, and, you know, I think that's what we've got to aim for, because the reality is that they're going to lose the single farm payment. Farming is already not profitable here. I mean, if you take away the subsidies, the average farm in North Devon makes minus £2,000 per year. Um, the environmental land management scheme, which is going to be put back in, even if they take the maximum level, it only gets them back up to fifteen thousand pounds a year for a whole family farm, on average. Mm. You know, you can't live on that these days. No. Um, so you know, uh, it's really it's important. a real challenge. So I think we've got to try and find this green finance 
top up funding to do things really at scale. Yeah, and that's right. that's so important. And just coming back to your sort of final message, it's the communities that in this environment are going to be so important. All the things we do in our gardens, in our in our villages here in Braunton, we've been supporting uh, wildlife verges, yeah. uh, and they they're getting more and more. Uh, important here and they're getting more funding from the air and do for a start yeah fantastic for that for cutting equipment for seed and so on so i'd like to see more of that kind of activity going on which can only help and it's tiny tiny steps but it it just means if people are fired up to do something in our village the most biodiverse yeah village <laughs> community in the whole country we're told let's try and hold on to that title yeah do you, do you have a nature plan for Brunton? i'm not sure we do no. for the parish I mean, it's being prepared at the moment. Oh, amazing. Is it? Oh, good. I think yeah. it would be really good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean. Hi. Um, yeah, I have a crack. I live in East End, which I rent a lot of farm in East End. Um, I've been sustainably in my landlord is an old time farmer. Fantastic. For 75, and even in the time of the I've been there uh, changing his attitude towards land stewardship uh, and the environment in general has just been quite profound really and we've been working uh, in his uh, mission project as well for um, schools really yeah. I think the I mean the engagement of the parish and I'll have a crack at East Bank. Go for it. Yeah, yeah. why not? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if you're not at all but the, um, but yeah schools your presentation should be part of the curriculum. <laughs> Absolutely right. Um, mm -hmm. I, there's no way to say it really um, there needs to be a real drive I think Policy level to try and get this integrated into schools at that level because you know, even the work we do in regards to uh, technology and, uh, and plastics awareness, um, if you engage the children, messages they can send through their own social groups and then up the ladder uh, with their parents as they go shopping in the local supermarkets uh, and choices they make in plastics, um, but there must be a, there has to be a drive now to get the younger generation engaged in this because if they know about it, they will drive along yeah. themselves. Yeah. I think that has to be, I think the, the fire space can really lead on uh, getting these schools properly, properly engaged now and getting this, uh, mm. uh, getting this into the curriculum uh, and then getting the support of the, the head teachers uh, mm. uh, around uh, to make sure that it is implemented even if it has to be a little bit of time. Um, yeah. I think we, we, we need to think, I'm looking at you, Billy, we need to think very seriously how we, because these two levels, the parish level and schools within the parishes and businesses within the parish, you know, if we can get that real local happening around the, yeah, the local environment, that's, that's where that happens. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and and well, well, I'll tell you an example at the beginning, as uh, a fashion example of how they've taken their own initiative. Yeah. I was in Indonesia many, many years ago surfing, um, talking about plastic waste and recycling. And the guy that I uh, like, yeah, I've been playing on my own way, and every first ball of hair is called way out. So I was like, but yeah, Wayne, how do we come, how do we come, like you, how do we come with, with the American dollars yeah. and then you can go surf and go on holiday if we don't do what you've done? Yeah. Oh, how sorry, the, um, You've oh. got an example there um, in Mongolia where the local community have taken strides against economic growth yeah. uh, to protect the local yeah. environment. Yeah. We need to find that catalyst here. Absolutely. I think one of the, one of the, if you just summarise what, what Wayne just so, said, sorry, because they said, can't yeah. hear him. Yeah, so, so uh, Wayne uh, was saying that he's working uh, uh, with a, a farmer who's in his 70s, mm -hmm. um, who has really changed his attitudes based on the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the pressures and the challenges that he's seeing. So he's, he's, you know, he thinks that's, uh, that's a really good sign, but uh, he emphasised the real importance of working with schools. Um, he thinks we've got to get these messages across to schools, I guess primary schools particularly, or yeah, yeah I think that's the place to start is primary mm -hmm. schools probably. Um, and we need to really think how we can get this into almost the curriculum of, of every school across the biosphere. So that's what he's saying. Yeah. 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 So the environment, so the environment is, is going to be a key opportunity in their careers in the future. So. Yeah. Uh, a real, real yeah. chance to do. And we've got a couple of questions on the chat. If you yeah. mind, I'll read them out. Um, so Nick has asked, "What do you think is the best community approach to help clean up our local rivers?" Well, Nick, I know very well. Hello, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Nick runs Sustainable Chumley, 
um, which is the group that I mentioned. And if anyone wants to uh, get some ideas or pass on some ideas about setting up a local you know, parish group, um, I'm sure Nick would be delighted to do it. We're, we're actually thinking of organising a Zoom uh, for the different uh, groups in the biosphere that exist. There are, there are, there are a few, and then there's you know, more specialist groups like the DWT group and others, but how to set up a, a parish group. So, uh, We've got some more so, as well. so uh, Nick was asking about how we get on with cleaning up the rivers. Well, Nick has actually also set up a Friends of the Little Dart, which is the Little Dart flows into the tour through Chumley. He set up a Friends of the Little Dart group. Nick, I, I, I think, uh, again, it comes down to, you know, to place. And I think uh, getting people you know, around a place is, is really important. Um, the challenge with the Little Dart and the other catchments is that, you know, a lot of the issues involve Farmers. Not all of them. There are issues around septic tanks and other things, and you know that is difficult. So maybe you know uh, we need to have community groups that are doing you know the citizen the science monitoring and are making people aware of the state of their rivers. That's really crucial. But then we need the farmers groups who are farmers talking to farmers about how to solve the issues. Um, and you know we 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 need to have again these maps. You know we need to get maps out. And look at what needs to be done in terms of putting new woodlands in or new hedges in to actually deal with these these complex issues so uh you know i think you're off to a good start um you know all strength to you <laughs> I'll, I'll be there can i ask the next Thanks. one on here is that okay um so we've got a comment and a question from debbie so she said the building with nature project sounds really good but the cynic in me worries that it may give some developers a head start in the planning applications if they say all the right things but is not um not monitored fully will the planning process develop more awareness of turning down developments that threaten our local nature that's a very good question um it's a very good question it's a very tough question I mean, the planners do their best. Uh, you know, we have, we have, you know, I know, I know several of the planners in North Devon and Torridge councils who have been hugely involved in putting this together. You know, they've been they've been there at the table in the you know the days when we spent you know we had a lockdown, yeah, you know, talking to each other about how we can put this together, and they've been there. They're the ones who are pushing with going for the building with nature scheme because they they believe it can improve what they're doing, you know, the reality is we are gonna have more development. Of course we are. Um, the key thing is we've got to make it nature positive. It's got to deliver a gain for nature and it's got to avoid uh, damaging nature. You know, I, I share your cynicism. It's a good question, um, well, but- it's, it's a huge opportunity here with the Friends of the Plan. So yep. that's gonna be under review and that'll be out for consultation. So if we can get the community yeah. as well as the key organisations like the Biosphere and this project um, to uh, feedback and to consultation, we can really get this yeah. um, mm -hmm. issue of the agenda on the local plan and make sure it gets into some future plan guidance. So Nic Nicola is, is saying that the local plan for Torridge and North Devon, uh, it's a joint plan, uh, is coming up for review. It's actually up for review now almost, isn't it? I think, is there a consultation now? I'm not sure about that. It, it, do check to see if the consultation is open already. But if there is, uh, this is an issue which uh, we can all push on and, and make a really strong point about it. Uh, the planners are they're fully aware of it, but you know we've got to we've got to have our voice. And thank goodness for some of the groups that have, have fought some of the things that have been going on recently. You know, uh, those who've spoken out and have stood up. You know, we need them. Um, you, know, you need activism as well as as well as getting on with the, the sort of stuff I've been talking about. Um, Debbie has said, uh, thank you, will be ideal if we can share ideas for how we can comment on local plans. Hmm. So that's brilliant. Thanks, um, Debbie. We just have uh, one more question from David. Um, he says, does the biosphere boundary match the water catchment of the Tor Torridge estuary? Uh, yes, so the, the biosphere boundary was, uh, drawn <laughs> uh, <clears throat> when, it, when it was uh, uh, done about 20 years ago to encompass, encompass the whole of the basins, the river basins of the Torontories. So from the uh, peatlands 
of Dartmoor and Exmoor that flow uh, into those rivers, but also it includes some of the North Devon streams, um, which so some of the smaller streams which flow uh, into the North Devon coast. Um, so it, it's basically from Fallen Point to, what's it called, South Heartland? Uh, uh, Marsland Mouth. That's the one, yeah. 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 Fallen Point to Marsland Mouth along the coast. And, and about of course, five kilometres out. And of course, out, and London. Out, to yeah. beyond, out to beyond Lundy. Yeah. yeah so so it's, it's a really, really good scale uh, designation. Yeah. Huge. I'm not worried. I think in sort of um, the pump fishing deep ends, um, it, and I think and as you rightly say, it is the um, stopping the continual degradation of habitat with the intensive dairy industries that we've got in North Devon. I mean, we've seen a lot of them pass out of uh, them, and, and the, the whole thing is, is that. You know, people are so used to, you know, obviously buying milk for one pound ten pence for two litres, and that the only way they can continue to do that is if we have the continue with the system we've got at the moment, which is, which, as we all know, is really um, the worst for nature and, and wildlife. And, you know, people go on about, oh, eating less meat and perhaps, you know, becoming vegan, but oh, what the, the best that you can do really is to stop drinking milk or uh, and eating cheese really. Um, because um, I mean I you know I see one only one or two really good dairy farms and they have to they they uh, charge for milk. Um, what is it now? To, um, to it's about three times as much as what it is in the supermarket anyway. And yeah. that's what obviously, realistically, they've got to do. So, how so Mary, can I just stop you? Because I don't sorry. think people on Zoom can yeah. hear you. So we want to just, just relay your question. So Mary has uh, asked, a question, asked a question about the, the dairy farms um, and the real challenge because milk is uh, you know, being sold to us at a very low price. And yet, you know, our purchasing of that milk is actually causing a huge amount of the problems that I've been talking about, you know, in the river systems and on the grasslands particularly. So, you know, um, I guess you know, what can be done, uh, I, you know, if farmers are, are paid a really proper price for it, uh, maybe they can incorporate uh, more environmental measures into it. Maybe we all need to uh, use less dairy products. Um, again, my view is that this is where that sort of uh, fourth slide up from the end that I showed about the supermarkets, this is where the supermarkets could make a real difference because if, if they knew that, uh, you know, if, if factories, if a factory was pouring, you know, some of the erosion and, and pollutants into the rivers, it would be shut tomorrow. It would be shut tomorrow. The environment agency would be on it immediately. And yet we are purchasing the milk you know, that's causing that in many ways. So I think, you know, it's a question of getting the standards up. We've got to, we've got to look at, you know, the sustainability of the farming sector. You know, this landscape is a farm landscape and it's really important that you know, farming, you know, will continue and it should continue, but farming, you know, needs to come much closer to nature and we need to identify some of these real pinch points. Yeah, we have to and pay actually, farmers to actually, yeah. yeah. So, so we need to pay properly for our milk and for other products yeah. to uh, make sure that some of these unintended consequences are averted. And also for na nature recovery on their yeah. properties. Yeah. Encouraging the conversion or reversal, reversal back from the short term days with all the um, you know, crops of silage, how many they take four or five a year, to maybe the, the permanent pasture with the hay meadows. Yeah. Um, and um, I mean, not a huge in intensive dairy farm I know, not far from where I've been my family is now, near Newton Tracy. I mean, they, they even put a human excrement on the field. What they put on, on the field um, all the time, and what those huge number of dairy cows, which are robotically milking yeah. and everything, it, it, it's, just, it's just awful. I mean, there's yeah. really just no. 
on the floor apart from your wood beginner yeah. few peasants. So I think uh, I think yeah, Mary sits on an important point. You know, it is it is a key issue in this area. Mm. It's, it's a very big issue. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Mary. John. You talked about the dynamics of squirrels and pine marrows, and the brick squirrels and pine marrows have been around for centuries long. How does the gray squirrel get nobbled by the pine So the red more the question is, uh, <clears throat> uh, what are the, uh, what's the story behind uh, uh, pine martins being good news for red squirrels? Um, it's, it's, it is a very interesting one. I heard a, heard a talk on it uh, not long ago. Um, uh, and basically, uh, there's, there's been some quite good research on the behavior of red and gray squirrels in relation to pine martin as a predator. And it seems that the red squirrel um, uh, basically has an avoidance mechanism, whereas the gray squirrel doesn't. It doesn't recognize pine martins. And uh, uh, there is very good evidence that the presence of pine martins uh, will greatly suppress uh, gray squirrels. This is mainly from Ireland, but there's also been uh, some studies done with stuff going on in Wales and yeah, Northumberland now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and interestingly, uh, there have been a couple of pine martins found squashed on the road here. Really? There was one in 2015 mm -hmm. um, found uh, somewhere, I think it was outside of Barstow, it was further south. Um, but uh, very interesting. I mean, yeah. and there's a population in Avon. Yeah, they are spreading. Yeah, yeah. the Vincent so, Wildlife Trust so has done a lot of work on it. They could yeah. well be here fairly soon, but there is a there is a consortium of organisations at the moment looking at the potential for uh, trying to uh, develop a reintroduction project. Yeah. So. Why is the first plan for Peter and Paul? That does seem a plan for conspicuous by its mission. Peter and Paul. Peter and Paul. Peter and There is. I'm um, just apologize. I literally, I literally pulled some, some flavors. There isn't a plan, but it is included. So the wet heathlands are included in the wetlands plan. And then the coastal dry heathlands are covered in the coast plan. Yeah. So dry heathlands are in the coast. Yeah. So what about inland? <laughs> you've, you've hit on a, an important point. <clears throat> we spent we spent a lot of time discussing it really? as to as to <laughs> where to put it. Um, because uh, we could have made another plan for the uplands. Uh, we could have had a sixth plan for the uplands, right. but it, it just became overwhelming in terms of the number of people. So we decided to put peat bogs and uh, other wet habitats in the uplands into the wetlands plan. Because it, it, it's just a question of putting the, the, the activities that are still there, but it's just a question of which cover you put them in. Um, and then we put the, the dry heath activities uh, and the, some of the, uh, the Exmoor dry heaths, for example, um, it's the coast plan. Coast, yeah. yeah, but yeah. we mentioned it's, if you read the thing in detail, you see we, we fretted over this for a while. Good dry heath, you know, on the hill. Yeah, the exactly, line. exactly. It's considerable now, but it was. The, the plans are going to be, uh, so they're going to be uh, kept as living documents. So we're going to review them every year. Um, if, we find, if we find the horseshoe bats uh, need something special next year, uh, we will incorporated into it and then at the end of the five years we'll do a detailed review and then, then uh, we'll do the plan as it looks like. Okay, any more we're, 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 we're about yeah. half past eight so I'm going to wrap it up there I think but thanks very much for your questions and interventions and uh, for you on Zoom as well thank you very much for putting up with slightly different, difficult sound. <laughs> yeah, thank you for being so yeah. patient yeah, with good us. Good see you. Yeah, and thank you once again to Mike for coming all this way from Chomley, <laughs> which is in the back of beyond, I know, to my cost. <laughs> and, <laughs> it's uh, a long journey, and thanks very much for making it, Mike. Uh, we really appreciate it. So thank you very much. Yeah, yeah.